Wow, you guys are ready. Never, never does it get quiet before we start teaching. I'm so excited. You know, this, um, this series called Not My Will But Yours Be Done is actually divided into a couple of subsets. Uh, certainly there's uh, the season that we're in right now is Not My Will. And we're uncovering that how strong our own will is in our hearts and how the devil knows a lot about us and he tries to hook us or get a, a foothold, the scripture would say, um, and then conquer our will to move away or be apart from Christ. We talked about that last week. If you were here last week, let me see your hand. Come on, show it. There, there it is, most of you. That's awesome. And we talked about Jesus Christ in that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane and the night before he was arrested and then tried and murdered on Friday, and in that place, if you remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane, on his face, he was battling temptation in this amazing, extreme work of prayer. He was praying so hard, working so hard, that blood actually started to pour out of his forehead. I have never prayed that hard. Have you? Have you ever been in that place where the work was so undoing that your sweat became as blood. Some doctors have said uh, in writing, and so I've read some of their reports, that his capillaries, the end of those blood veins, would begin to explode and it would actually come out of his skin. That is stress in prayer. That is work in prayer. And we learned that temptation is so powerful and so insidious, if you remember, we had that cut flower up here, that you can actually think that you are still supple and alive and fresh, but that you are separate from the word and the will of Christ. That's how insidious and subtle temptation is. And Jesus showed us how to battle in that work. He demonstrated the power of staying connected in the intense work of prayer so that he was able to surrender his will to that of his Father. That was the issue at hand. Our salvation by Jesus Christ being obedient 100% all of the time to accomplish the purposes of his Father. Next week, we're going to look at Peter, one of my favorite disciples. Um, he's kind of spontaneous. He thinks something and does it almost in the same second. I'm a little more planned and thoughtful than that, but oh, I wish I was spontaneous. In fact, uh, next week, Wednesday, I'm going to work on being spontaneous. Three o'clock in the afternoon. I got it on my schedule already. <clears throat> we're going to look at Peter and his denial of Jesus around the campfire. Remember that at Caiaphas' house in the courtyard there? when they were having that mock kangaroo trial and Peter kind of sneaks in and shows up. And we're going to see how sneaky temptation really is, noting that uh, one plus one is, and one is three. It's simple math, but we're going to look at the compound work of how Peter uh, got in uh, really deep. And um, he actually ended up swearing and lying and um, cussing at this little servant girl who said, hey, aren't, aren't you one of them? And then others around the fire. It was a terrible moment for him. And uh, I don't know, I wasn't there. Um, but uh, uh, I wonder if when they came up to him again the third time and they said, hey, aren't you one of them? Did he said, uh, you know, come on, you want s'more of this? Um, I think that's the first time someone said s'more around the campfire. <laughs> and now it's a thing. Um, it's not in the scripture. You don't have to write that down. It's simply a mnemonic device to help you remember the story of Peter. All right, um, so what we should do instead is pray, yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 22. That address is up on the screen, Luke chapter 22. We're going to start, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the verse in just a second, but find Luke chapter 22, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book, New Testament, because uh, this week we're going to talk about Judas, and we're going to learn that following Jesus and uh, doing the Father's will is not a one and done thing. It's not something that you commit to one day and then it just sticks, it's it's something that requires work again and again and again. We have to redirect our lives, our footsteps, like a sailboat tax, you know, and it moves with, even against the wind to get uh, across the lake. And if we don't do that, if we don't adjust, if we don't tack, we're going to end up at a place where we don't want to be. So uh, let's start with prayer and ask God to bless us as we hear and study his word. The prayer verse to help us center and be quiet in our hearts is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It's on the screens, and it is a reminder that by the renewing of our minds, we can move into obedience. Here's what the word says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to attest and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's jump off there and pray. Pray with me. Father God, transform us inwardly by a complete change of our minds. Make us able to know your will, O God, that which is good and pleasing and is perfect to you. As we open your word, I pray that you will open our hearts so that beginning again today, we will say, not my will, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. We pray this uh, in the power of your spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So maybe some of you were, uh, were watching us get ready for worship and you're wondering why there's a blender in worship. I'm pretty excited about that, uh, so pay attention. Um, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Uh, and it will help us uh, identify the condition of our heart, the transformation of our heart, and the reformation that God is doing in our lives. All of that with one ninja ice maker. <laughs> I'm pretty excited. Actually, it's a snowmaker. That's what they call it. Luke chapter 22. Let's get ready to jump in at verse 1. Luke 22, verse 1. It's on the screen. Here we go. Luke begins with a time stamp. He helps us understand what's going on. He says, now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. Now you and I, we may not have an emotional reaction to that sentence, but the first readers and hearers of that word did. The Jews in that day, they did because they understood what it was to prepare for the Passover. This is the Passover in which Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. In the middle of this longing of God's people to remember God's redeeming love, saving his people from slavery in Egypt, all by the blood of the lamb, they were getting ready to celebrate and remember God's salvation. So when Luke says that time was approaching, he knew people felt that the anticipation was thick. It was heavy. You could feel it. You could almost see it. And Jesus knew that history was about to change. Verse 2, Luke 22, verse 2. And the chief priests, so they're preparing too, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. This is where the story collides. There's a collision in this moment. Um, People are preparing to celebrate God's redemption And all the while, their hearts are conspiring. The the religious leaders are conspiring. The scripture says to get rid of Jesus. This is not a soft word. Literally, it means to end someone's life, to murder them. They were looking for a way to kill Jesus. Why? Because they were afraid of the people. Don't read too fast here. Remember, while getting ready to celebrate the salvation of Israel and freedom from slavery, they were conspiring to kill Jesus because they were afraid of people? Afraid they would lose followers? Afraid the status quo, that that tenuous relationship they had with the Roman soldiers, that somehow that would be disrupted? Their plans would be ruined? This shows us, in just these two verses, the condition of the human heart one that looks forward to celebrating God's redemption of his people and all the while harboring hatred and fear and murderous conspiracy in their hearts. The condition of the human heart that denies Jesus as Lord is in trouble. This is one of those parallel plot events. There's going to be a convergence. You're going to see it in just a minute. Luke shows us. It's where Satan's scheme, he's been working over here and he's been working over there and he's going to move people onto this, into the same scene, into the same act of the play that he's writing, onto the same platform to accomplish his evil schemes. This is, this is what's happening, a convergence that Satan is rolling out, working in the hearts of these and those, and then bam, synergy. Here it is, Luke 3, and Luke 22, verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas called the Iscariot, one of the twelve. That's a terrible epitaph, isn't it? Here's Judas, Iscariot, one of the twelve. 
when the fires were stoked in the hearts of the chief priests and the teachers of the law, Satan schemed and plotted and worked in the heart of Judas. And now he's going to bring them together. Let me show you something. Look on the screen here a minute. Let's see if this works. It worked during, uh, during rehearsal. Um, what you're going to notice in today's scripture uh, is a couple of things. Um, the first is the compound weight of temptation. And so what we see here is that Satan is working in the heart of the chief priests and teachers of the law. And so they have a conspiracy that's building in their heart, and there's some weight to that. And in that small group, and they're pretty tight, and they share their secrets of conspiracy and all their plans, and they're affirming one another. And so it's a pretty solid, closed group. But now, remember what the Scripture says. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. So now Satan reaches out, and he builds another conspiracy, and he begins to add that up. And so what we have now here is one plus one is three. He's working in this group and in that group, but the sum, the total, is more than each part. It's kind of how um, Satan schemes in the heart of God's people today is that he might be working in one of us particularly and we begin to believe on truth. We begin to question the word and the will of God. And, and we begin to have thoughts in our heart. And we wonder, what do we, what do, we do with that? And then all of a sudden, we come across um, uh, others who uh, affirm and confirm what we're thinking and feeling, right? And there's a compound effort of the scheme of the devil. The synergy of that is great. You're going to see it in the heart of Judas over these next few verses. And uh, let me give you a spoiler alert. Um, if, if you like to think uh, uh, in pictures, if you're an artist or you like to draw or scribble, um, this is how I see it. So here's Judas's timeline. And uh, Satan enters the heart of Judas, and he's carrying out his plot. And from the day that Satan entered Judas all the way to that moment, do you remember where that was when Jesus was in the garden with his disciples and they were praying and then afterwards Jesus went, hey, what are you guys doing sleeping? And while he was still talking, Judas shows up with his group, with his posse, and he gives him a kiss and betrays him. Until that point, you would think that what Satan did when he entered Judas, it was a done deal, that Judas didn't stand a chance. But if you read the scripture, after Judas went and conspired with the teachers of the law, he had the opportunity to say no. He had the opportunity to off-ramp, to get off that plan and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And then he went back and had supper with Jesus. He could have spent time with Jesus and, and said, no, I'm not going to do this. I mean, when you're in presence sharing the Lord's Supper with Jesus in worship, that'd be a good time to say, no, I'm not going to do this. And then he went off and he waited. While he was waiting, he could have changed his mind. And then he shows up in the garden and Jesus looks straight at him and says, really, you're going to do this? At that point, he could have fell on his face. Notice all the off ramps that he could have taken. This is how temptation works. And we're going to learn in just a second that Satan will lie to us at every one of these opportunities to avoid his scheme and he's going to say, no, it's too late. No, don't take the offering. Does that make sense? Say yes if it does. Temptation compounds. And temptation has opportunities to off-board, to take the off-ramp and get away from it. And when we don't, like we just said, then you end up where you don't want to be. All right, let's get back to the scriptures, verse 4. Luke 22, verse 4. Go ahead and put that on the screens. Thank you. And Judas... Now notice who moves here. This is Judas. Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. This is how it starts, planning a conspiracy. This is one way that Satan works. When someone goes off the rails, he gives them encouragement. He brings yes men into their lives to say, you know, you're right. We're with you. This heightens the importance of having truth speakers in your life, of being in a small group of accountability. Um, I have some friends, uh, and I was just with uh, one uh, Tuesday, maybe, Tuesday morning, 
and he was telling me about his accountability meeting over the weekend with the two men that he meets with. And they take turns uh, being transparent with each other and saying, here's where I'm struggling. Here's what I'm thinking. Help me think about that. And they confess to one another in prayer so that they might be healed. And his life is uh, marked with holiness and Christ-likeness because he's in accountability. He is pursuing relationships with those who speak to him truth, not conspiracy and scheme of the devil. Does that make sense? This scripture tells us, make sure we have those people in our lives. Otherwise, there's nothing to compare what we think. Judas was in it deep now. Whatever reticence he had was melted by this fire. I mean, he knew he couldn't do this alone. He needed some help, so he joined Satan's other minions. You could almost hear them buttering him up, right, when he shows up and he tells them what he's thinking, you know, because now they, I mean, they wouldn't want to kill Jesus themselves. They needed someone to do that. Now they have someone who will kill Jesus, and they can make it an inside job. Imagine how that would play in the morning paper, taken down by one of his own. Oh, the conspiracy just got better for them. And Satan must have wrung his hands a little bit and, and maybe even giggled in devilish delight as he watched this play out. Judas and the religious leaders together were in deep. You see, it's one thing to think something, even if you're not right. They could have surrendered these thoughts to the Holy Spirit, to the Word of God. They could have seen Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Son of God, just like they were told he was. But nope, this is the power of convergence on those yielded in temptation. Religious leaders conspiring who needed an impl implementer. Now here comes Judas and they're delighted. So they calculate a bounty and they agree to give it to him. And Judas consents. We're going to look at that word in a minute. And then he goes off to strategize and to lurk and to stalk Jesus and to figure out his schedule in fear of the same people as the religious leaders. And while he waits... The cement in his heart hardens each second that he hides in the darkness. And in the darkness, without the light of life, his heart grows ice cold. It says all this in uh, verse 5 of chapter 22. It's on the screen. Luke 22, 5. Speaking of the religious leaders, they were delighted, Luke says. They were delighted. They're in more trouble than they know. Delight um, is uh, ekereson, which is from uh, Cairo, which means to delight in God's grace to his people, to rejoice in the goodness of God. Now, let that sink in a minute. They thought they were doing God's work. That killing Jesus was God's will, his favor to the people to silence the lamb. Assigning to God... Let me start over. Listen. Assigning to God the work of the devil is a smoky place. Very near the gates of hell. When we say something wicked and a scheme of the devil is actually God's will, we're down the road pretty far. I let that sink in. I was in my office Wednesday afternoon. I had some music playing in the background. It drowns out the rest of the noise in the building, the meetings and the conversation that's going on. And so in the sequestering of my office with some music. The song that was playing is Worthy Are You, Jesus. Um, I melted right there in my chair a little bit, and I began to pray, and my hands went up. And uh, through tears, I just began to pray, because this verse cuts. I mean, I've been praying about how I think, God, help me. Help me to be aligned with your will. I know John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's about relationship that moves me into obedience for his will, Amen. So God, help me to love you. Help me to know you. Help me to be in a relationship with you, Jesus. Help me not to assign disobedience to your will. And I actually wrote down my prayer because I was just typing it as I prayed. God, uh, can I share it with you? Say yes if I can share that prayer with you. It's only three sentences. God, help us all to know your will, to be discerning and diligent in prayer and full of the Holy Spirit. Strengthen us in temptation and keep us from running away from you. Keep us from trusting our own wisdom and understanding and to fear you with a holy fear that pursues righteousness and holiness. God, you are enough. Jesus, you are all I need. I surrender all to you, Jesus. 
I think it's good when scripture first slays the pastor before it gets spoken in worship. The word of God is a double-edged sword, and I'm praying that in this Lenten season, um, that as I move more closely in alignment with his will, that he would teach me and show me, that he would search my heart, and if he finds any wickedness or anxiety, he would let me know so that I can confess it and be free from it. Anyway, thank you for letting me share a moment in my studies with you. Uh, Let's get back to the text. Verse 5. This is the leaders again. They were delighted. And they agreed to give him money, and he consented. That word means to agree without reservation. And he watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them. So now he goes away and lurks and waits. When no crowd was present, remember, he was afraid of the people. They all walked away from that secret meeting satisfied. The religious leaders, they went back to their family to prepare the Passover lamb. And Judas went back to the other disciples to prepare the Passover with Jesus, who is the lamb. What must that feel like? To fake worship. To fake allegiance to Jesus. To put on the costume of a disciple. But underneath, in your heart, you're full of betrayal and hatred. Or maybe Judas thought it was love. I mean, we know that he chose self and silver over the Savior. Judas's heart was full, but it wasn't of love for Jesus. It was full of duplicity and betrayal, and somehow his mind was given over to evil. And his prayer was not your will, but mine be done. Look at 22 verse 20. This is where we hear those communion words. In the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you, but the hand of him who's going to betray me is with mine at the table. Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal with Judas. Verse 22, the son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be. Who would do this? And in some of the other Gospels, they looked at each other and said, is it me, is it me? Who would do this? And Judas was in the middle of that, only for him it was a charade. He could have fallen on his face and confessed in that moment. He could have said to Jesus, the temptation was too great and that he was going to betray him. And I would put my life on the line that if he would have done that in that moment, Jesus would have forgiven him completely and set him free from that temptation. Judas chose to keep it quiet and in his heart, in the darkness. He chose to not take the off-ramp to his plans. He could have, but he didn't. Instead, he just parroted the innocent and he made himself look like a genuine follower. He'd already made up his mind, so it's almost mocking when he says it to Jesus. Matthew 26, 25, the word of God says this. Judas said to Jesus, surely you don't mean me. And Jesus said, you have said so. This is your confession. This is the testimony of your plans. And so Judas went off to carry out his plan, knowing Jesus would be in the garden, so that was his opportunity. Luke twenty two forty two. 42. While he was still speaking, that is Jesus to his disciples, the crowd came up and a man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? This was an opportunity for Judas to make it right. He could have fallen on his face right there and stopped the whole thing. Another temptation, and Jesus would have helped. But he didn't. Verse 49. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Most of the time, that part of the story goes unheard. It's good for you to breathe. Come on. I'm so sorry. That's actually how I think. Uh, You know how that story ended though, right? Jesus picked it up and touched him and he was healed. But um, (laughs) 
Oh my goodness, if you had in, if you heard from me all the things that I hear in my head when I prepare sermons, uh, we'd be here longer and my career would be shorter. All right, here we go. <laughs> Imagine if Judas would have confessed, if he would have said, not my will, not my will, yours be done. Imagine if he would have fallen on his face and done that hard work. What would have changed? I know this. Instantly, his guilt would have been removed. He would have been forgiven, but he didn't take the opportunity. This is the hard part to accept and believe, that apart, listen, that apart from Holy Spirit renewal of our minds, we will remain broken in our sin. And we think that what we're thinking is right. You see, we believe in total depravity, which means that every part of my being has been affected by sin, and that although I'm not as bad as I could be, there's not a part of me that's trustworthy, and apart from Christ, I'm dead in sin. It's what we believe. It's in our confessions. What we think can't be trusted unless it's measured by the word and the will of God. Let's look at how Judas was conquered. It's that same diagram. Jesus is ready to celebrate and to fulfill the Passover, the blood of the lamb for the sins of the people, to protect them from God's wrath. That's the big picture. And when the saving plans of God are implemented, no matter what part of the plan that that is, that's when Satan gets frantic and he tempts people with strong, overwhelming temptation. Everything he has. So Satan already built a conspiracy in the hearts and minds of the religious leaders, and now Satan moves the implementer into place, and Judas gets encouraged by them, powerful people telling him that what he's doing is right. He's helping protect God's people. Satan made both the leaders and Judas afraid of people, so they moved into secret places. And instead of bringing it into the light where Jesus would shine truth on it, Satan kept them alone in the dark. Satan wants us to be alone in the dark. Judas got tons of affirmation and approval and silver and maybe some high fives from those leaders. And he ate it up because Satan loves to tell you that you're right when you're not. Judas missed all the off-ramps. Even Jesus' words at the table, the leader's words, the money, the time to conspire in the garden. Jesus said, are you really going to do this? You see, here's the deal. When we're in it that deep, when we don't take the off-road uh, to our plans um, and in our thinking, we end up pretty far down the road. And Satan tells us, it's too late. There's no turning back now. We have to do it. But in that place, look at how Judas processed his own condition. He was fearing people instead of God. He accepted silver instead of a savior. He faked his love for Jesus while planning his death. He chose temporary reward over heavenly inheritance. And he preferred the approval of men over that of God. He gave up everything he knew about Jesus so he wouldn't be counted with Jesus. He knew that following Jesus might cost him his life, so he made his own plans to save his own life. And he ended up losing it. Can we get honest today and look how Satan still works and attacks our hearts? This isn't just some Bible story that our children are hearing from uh, a, a, an artist, you know, pictures in their children's Bible. This same Satan is still at work in the hearts of God's people. As Jesus' lifeblood cleanses and changes us and calls us to follow him in obedience and transformation, the question we need to ask is, how is our heart? When the blood of the Lamb washes over you, Satan unleashes furious temptations. I wondered, maybe you'll wonder with me, have, have I, have we avoided any off-ramps? And now we find ourselves pretty far down the road, afraid of other, what they would say if we turn back, what they would say about us. I mean, we built a reputation and a facade that we spent all our energy upholding. And now if we surrender that to follow God's will, what, what will people think of us? Are we afraid to really love Jesus, to surrender our lives to his will instead of hedging our bets like Judas did? I want you to know that no matter how far down the road you think you are, no matter how far down the road you really are, you can turn around. It's the truth. It's called repentance. It's a 180. It's a U-turn. It's when you turn around and leave behind the life of sin, when you turn around, you know what you will see? The face and the hands of Jesus welcoming you into his presence. That's what you find in repentance. 
But Judas didn't turn around. He didn't back down. You can. And all that requires is for you to fall on your face and surrender your will and say, not mine, not my will. Lord, I want to surrender it. Yours be done. Renew my mind for my thinking. Renew my heart for my believing. Renew my hands and life for behaving. You see, Satan is tempting us, and he's already working schemes against us. It's in the scripture, so own it. Read Revelation 12, 12, where it says, But woe to you, O earth, for Satan has been cast down to you. You see, he can't defeat Jesus. There's no one more powerful than Jesus. So he takes it out on the sons and daughters of God. But woe to you. He's unleashing his fury against us. John 10, 10, we know that it says that Jesus has come that we might have life and have it abundant. But the first part of that verse says that the, the devil, the evil one, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's not for you. He's against you. That's how it is. His name is death, and he is a liar. There might even be people of reputation and leadership roles that are a part of your life that will speak for Satan to you and tell you you're okay. But remember, temptation is not sin. You are not defeated, and you can turn around. The Holy Spirit lives in the heart of every believer, and the Holy Spirit will power you in temptation. Satan wants you to think it's too late, that you're already lost and judged, and that you're just the scum of the earth, and none of those things are true. Today, we can respond to the Word of God and turn around. Uh, it's not my promise, it's his. First, uh, First Corinthians 10, 13, it's on the screen. When you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So let's start today. Look for the off-ramp sign. Look for the opportunity to leave behind the journey that we're on if it's taking us away from God. Let's name those dark, ice-cold places in our hearts where we're allowed, where we've allowed the schemes of the devil to come to life, where we let our imagination and anticipation of sin off the leash and run around inside of our hearts. And we think that those deadly tenants of temptation who we've allowed into the home of our hearts, that they'll treat us nicely. We allow them to do whatever, thinking they'll be fine, we'll be fine, but they'll jump you in a second. They'll jump you at the worst time. Remember, this is a scheme. And they won't send notice to tell you, oh, 2 o'clock tomorrow, that's when you're going to be tempted the worst. They're going to surprise you. We're going to see next week, it, it's like Peter. Um, he was just cruising along telling Jesus, there's no way I would leave you. I would die for you. And he just falls right into the manhole. We're going to talk about that next week. Um, so say yes if I can have your permission to be honest a second. <laughs> One of you is confident, and nine of you are thinking, okay. Um, I didn't practice this at home, so let's see how it goes. Uh, I talked about the, the ice coldness in our heart, that the longer that um, we allow ourselves to be in the dark and we don't compare our lives to the Word and the will of God, Ice starts to form in those dark places. And um, sometimes we dare talk about this stuff. Uh, I've been in men's ministry in small groups, and we'll talk about the easy stuff. Yeah, I, I spent too much time at, during coffee break at work last week, and I took 15 minutes of paid labor. I took that from my boss, and I didn't get anything done. And, and we feel that that's, that's pretty safe. Um, and maybe, maybe someone would, would dare say that um, murder's a sin, <laughs> and it is, by the way. Um, murder's a sin, but I haven't committed that one, so I feel pretty good about that one, right? Um, uh, there's a bunch of other ones, right? Fornication, yeah, that, that's not my deal either, so I'm fine. Um, stealing, yeah, besides a stapler and a little bit of time, I, I didn't really take the stapler. It wasn't me, Jana. Um, <laughs> um, you know, maybe you did some photocopying at work, right? And you used the paper, uh, the photocopier at work and for personal stuff. And so see how, the, see how benign this is? And then we get into that place and, and we start to get honest. See, those, those, are the, those are the acceptable sins, right? The ones that it's okay for us to talk uh, about here. Um, remember we did that series called, um, what was it? Was it called Acceptable Sins? 
Pardon? Respectable sins. Remember that? There's even a book by that title. Maybe there's some stuff that it's okay for us to talk about. What about the ones that it's not safe to talk about? What about regardless of whether you're singled or married, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, do you know that God has a will for you? And it's in his word. And we are called to align to that. What about adultery? I haven't. What about my eyes? I once heard it was in a high school Bible study that I was in, and uh, the, the football coach was leading that Bible study, and he said, you know, when you guys are out, and I used to run cross country to get ready to play basketball, and he said, when you guys are out running, and you see a girl running, and, and you look at her, that's temptation. That's not the sin. It's, it's when you run around the block to look again. <laughs> that's where the sin is. Do you know what Jesus says about lust in our hearts? You've already committed adultery with her in our heart. Remember that? What about murder? I've never... But have I hated? Jesus said that when you harbor hatred in your heart towards a brother, it's murder. What about gossip? Did you know that's in the scripture right there in Romans? Right along with all those other ones that we get really angry about and then we go to McDonald's and talk about other people. Not that McDonald's is the bad place, it's just the gossip. You know that gossip is actually a crazy sin because it feeds our pride, our selfishness. It makes us feel like we're more powerful. Right? Because I know stuff about you and I get to talk to you with other people. We don't talk about that one. What about slander? When gossip gets really going, right? And then we use someone's name in vain and we put them down and they're not there to defend themselves. What about injustice? Where I avoid or withhold the opportunity to share with someone who needs it or don't care about their brokenness or their insecurities. I have the opportunity to help feed and to house and bring transportation. And I say, yeah, you know, go and be well. What about those things? Those are harder to talk about. Now let's get really honest. You know, sexual sin is a really big issue right now, right? Our, our classes, our denomination, there's a prayer opportunity this Wednesday. I'll send you some information about that. And we're going to be talking about human sexuality in our synod this summer in June. And uh, some people are, are uh, in an uproar about this. And they're saying, how come you only talk about that one sin? What about gossip and all the other things? And I say, yes, let's talk about this one and the other ones. Let's bring it all into the light. What about if our, if our culture... Um, is okay with fornication and slander and injustice and we use different words for it. We, we use words like Netflix and chill. We use words like swipe left, swipe right, right? And so we spend time entertaining and harboring and allowing the tenants of temptation to live in our hearts and they're bad tenants and they will jump you in a second. But what about envy and strife and discontentment? and unthankfulness, and withholding the tithe. Did you know those are all in Scripture too? Some of us will even save, and they'll say, well, you know, I'll save, and I'm going to give that as a tithe if there's no rainy days. That's not how Scripture describes it. Scripture decides you, you give it first. You, give, you sacrifice the first animal that breaks the womb, trusting God for the rest of the herd. You sacrifice the first crop, trusting God for the rest of the crop. It's first. And we withhold it. Did you know that scripture actually describes um, the fee or the cost for recovering the tithe? That if you've been withholding it, then you give the tithe back and it calculates for the little extra that you put on the top. To re it's all in the scripture. But we don't talk about that. We don't talk about some of us today, if statistically we're normal, some of us today will sit here and worship, worship and hear the word of God and the call of Jesus to align our will to his and then we'll go home and we'll open our phones and guess what's going to be on there? And we're going to wander off in our imaginations and there will be adultery with 10, 20, 40, 50 people this week. This week? Because we're watching online? Let's be honest. Is it okay that we're honest? Can we talk about this stuff? Don't we have to? Yes, amen. Because this is the stuff that has invaded our hearts that is tempting us. But remember, temptation is not sin. There's all those offerings. We have the opportunity at everything to fall on our faces and to ask God to heal us from that. I don't want to even be a part of disunity, which is also in the scripture. But listen to this, listen to this verse. It's, um, it's in scripture. And go ahead and put it up on the screens. It's from Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close 
to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed, crushed in spirit. It is like the work of Jesus in the garden to pray so hard that blood comes from your forehead that we take all of our temptation and we bring it in prayer. And re instead of being ice cold and hard and immovable and unshapeable, we let him wash us that we might be as white as snow. This is a ninja snowmaker. Now you can take that out and you can make a snow cone. You could shape it and reshape it. We become malleable and formable and shapeable when we allow ourselves to do the jarring, loud, hard, crushing work of taking our temptation and our will and placing it before the Father. Say, not me, not me, not my will, but yours be done. This is how it starts. It starts small, and then it grows. And if we don't tend to it, if we're normal, we will be addicted to a coping mechanism that takes us away from our pain and confusion, but it simply harbors sin. Whether it's pornography on our phone or binging on Hulu instead of spending time with God, I'm not saying you shouldn't watch TV. But be careful, even shopping or gossip over coffee or filling our minds with social media instead of the Word of God. Soon, we built in behaviors and beliefs that make it more difficult to off-ramp. And the devil knows the, what is it? Somebody help me. Is it, is it endorphins? What is that that happens when we, when we watch movies and do things and, and shop that makes us feel good? Uh, when I was in college uh, in, in behavioral sciences, I actually taught a chicken to feed itself. It would peck a little thing on the side of its cage and food would drop out and it would do that again, it would drop out. And in that research, I also found a study where some scientists connected two probes to the, to the brain of a rat and it was the pleasure center in his brain and he would push that button because it was so pleasing to him, he would push that button again and again and again. He avoided food and water until he died. The scheme of the devil is to destroy you and to fill you with the pleasures of this world so much that you avoid a relationship with God. I know it's 1115. I'm so sorry about that. But this is the word of God. Amen? And we got to deal with this. We have to deal with the truth that the devil is against us, not for us. So I'm going to invite you. Um, here's our closing prayer. Uh, put Psalm 51. This is just verse 17, where David uh, is confronted by the prophet Nathan who tells him all about how he stole Bathsheba from his neighbor and then committed a murder to hide it. See how dark this gets? And all he did was stay home from work that day. In the time of year when kings go off to war, David stayed home. He should have gone to work, amen? But he stayed home and watched the big screen of his neighbor taking a bath. He said, my sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Let's pray together. God of truth, I don't like to face the sin in me. It's ugly and it's frightening. But avoiding it only gets me tangled deeper in deception. So give me the courage to let you take an honest look at my heart. Search me and know me and may that honestly make me long more and more for your salvation that sets me free from this body of death. Father God, we worship you because you love us unconditionally. You've demonstrated your love for us in this. While we were still sinners, you sent Jesus Christ to die for us. And so help us, Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit to surrender our will to yours. Not my will, Lord Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. Heal me of my pride, fill me with your truth, separate me from my sin that I might be full of life. Help me, Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit to know the sin in me and confess it to you, to turn away in repentance, to take the off-ramps, to turn from sin and return to you. Because when I do, when I confess, you're faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Father God, help us to be a safe community where we can find a holy accountability and share our temptations and struggles and sins with each other. For your word says, when I confess my sins to my brother, I'm healed. Father God, I want to be set free from the sin that so easily entangles. 
from the temptations that overwhelm me. I want to live a life that brings you glory and praise so I can shine your light and speak the truth and seek first your kingdom and righteousness, to love you with everything that I have and everything that I am and to love others as I should. Fill me with such a great love for you, deep in relationship with you, that I want you above everything, that my heart will ache when I go against your heart, that I want nothing more than to bless you, because if I love you, I will keep your commandments. Help me, help us, help our church to be alive. Help us to speak the truth in love and to be kind and gracious, full of mercy, and to be patient with each other and help each other align our lives with your word and will. Father God, this is our prayer. May your word today be planted deep in our hearts to grow a great harvest of faithfulness and righteousness for your glory. God, I confess, I can't do this alone. In temptation, I'm weak. I can't do it, but you're strong, and I can do all things in Christ Jesus. So today, I commit to guard my heart, to take every thought captive, to submit my will to yours, no matter how much it hurts. Sometimes I don't like this prayer, Jesus, because I know the depth and darkness of my sin. Sometimes I'm afraid to bring it into the light. But God, I know that you're full of compassion and that you love the brokenhearted and you save those who are crushed in spirit. So renew me, renew us, and make us whole again. Set our feet on a rock. Help us in this Lenten season to become brand new. Erase the guilt of our sin. Wash us clean in the blood of the Lamb and make us